All right, so welcome back. In part two of this three-part series adapted from my public lecture, we talked about the role of censorship, its impact on storytelling in the 19th century, and how that has produced, of course, the sexy vampire. So let's check in again. We recognize the importance of copyright and the power of the commons and the tension of censorship, which altogether gives us a lot of directions to think about with creativity. And we've learned, of course, why vampires are a great opportunity to make money. So now it's time to take a look at how and why the Hulk will get you sued. Think we're ready for that? Now, in order to talk about the Incredible Hulk, we actually have to talk about a certain person by the name of Edward Hyde. Who is Edward Hyde? So we all know the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or do we? The novella was published in 1886 by Robert Louis Stevenson, and the novel dealt with the strange relationship between one Dr. Henry Jekyll, that's right, that's how they pronounced it, Jekyll, and one Mr. Edward Hyde. So what do we know about the relationship between these two? Spoiler alert! That's right, they are one in the same person. Dr. Jekyll creates a formula that he takes and it turns him into Mr. Hyde, a man without conscience or restraint. Hyde sets up life in the shadier part of town and eventually commits murder. People know there is some kind of relationship between the two, and funny enough, the novel, Sex Obsessed, but not able to really talk about it because it was 1886, hints that Hyde could either be Jekyll's bastard child or his lover, all in the same sentence. One character, Mr. Enfield, says, the following. Blackmail, I suppose, an honest man paying through the nose for some of the capers of his youth. And this, at that time, could have indicated either of those options. So while we've established who Edward Hyde is, I would like to ask, ask you, what does he look like? After all, if you have never read the novella, there has been over 30 film adaptations and 14 TV shows but also his appearances in dozens more TV shows, such as Penny Dreadful, Once Upon a Time, Tom and Jerry, Looney Tunes, Scooby-Doo, DuckTales, and yes, his very own video game. Actually, two video games, which is always a sign that you've really made it. So, what does Hyde look like? Which one of these are the most accurate depictions of Edward Hyde? Maybe these people that we see here, these depictions? or these guys. Now, there's some distinct differences between the two sets. In the earlier images, Hyde is small and diminutive, but in the later ones, he's big and bulky. So how do we explain these differences? Well, first, it's useful to look at how Stevenson describes Edward Hyde. Hyde was pale and dwarfish. He gave an impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. He had a displeasing smile. He was small, with shocking expression of his, of his face, with his remarkable combination of great muscular activity and great apparent debility of constitution. Rather, as there was something abnormal and misbegotten in the very essence of the creature that now faced me, something seizing, surprising, and revolting. So, those earlier images are all from the first half of the, early, of the 20th century, or the late 19th century. The later images are all within the last 20 years, there are a lot of reasons why we see the difference, but the biggest is this guy right here. There's a good chance that you know who the Incredible Hulk is, but let me give you a brief description. He was created in 1963 by Marvel Comics, in particular Stan Lee, or as you know him, the old dude who keeps showing up in those Marvel movies. Scientist Bruce Banner is testing a, a gamma bomb when he discovers there's someone on the test field. He saves that person and exposes himself to gamma radiation that turns him into the Hulk. We can see some similarities. Dr. Banner and Dr. Jekyll both are gentlemen scientists. Both are exposed to experimental science of their own making. Both become monsters as a result. Now beyond that, the Hulk has several other inspirations. Unbeknownst to many, there was the first was The Thing from the Fantastic Four, published in 1962 by Lee and Jack Kirby. The Thing is a self-hating hero, and we wanted to replicate that with the Hulk. But he was also inspired by Boris Karloff's version of Frankenstein. So the Incredible Hulk is a little bit of everything. He was adapted from The Thing, he was narratively inspired, 
by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who's visually inspired by Karloff's Frankenstein. So now let me ask you, how does Banner transform into the Hulk? That's right, rage, emotion, excitability. Which, if we think about the ideas of Victorian emotional repression, we can see how well aligned the Incredible Hulk is with Hyde. But here's a fun fact in one additional element to Hyde's lineage. He was also inspired by werewolves. In that first 1960 series, Banner initially transformed into the Hulk at night, just like a werewolf. Therefore, with popular and creative, while popular and creative in its own way, the Incredible Hulk drew upon no less than four different stories. The Fantastic Four, which was a Marvel property, Jekyll and Hyde, which was a public domain work, the Karloff Frankenstein, which inspired but was distinct enough not to infringe upon copyright, and werewolves. Now, keeping in mind that Karloff's Frankenstein was an, was an adaptation of a story in the public domain, you find that the Incredible Hulk was its own Frankensteinian monster, created from the pieces of the commons with just a quarter from a copyrighted work, which Marvel already owned. It raises the question, could the Incredible Hulk have been created or popular without drawing upon public domain? Keep that thought in the back of your head because we still have to answer the question, and I think you're starting to get a hint of how we go from a diminutive Hyde to a ginormous Hyde. As I mentioned, the Jekyll and Hyde has been quite popular, but the Incredible Hulk has been more popular. High Hulk has five of his own TV series, including one in 1966 in the live action series of the 1980s. He appeared in many other TV series beyond that. He had two of his own feature films, three direct-to-TV films, and of course, is part of the Avengers series. He has also had dozens of comics, comic series, hundreds of appearances in other comics besides his own, and had at least a dozen or more books featuring him. He also has five video games named after him. However, the truest sign that, Hyde outcompetes, that Hulk outcompetes Hyde is this. You can scour the interwebs, but I don't think you're going to find a Hyde version of ladies' lingerie. And I'm not going to lie, I have all sorts of questions. But all of this is to say that our modern visual conception of Hyde is very much informed by the Incredible Hulk. In part because while Jekyll and Hyde gives us a popular and well-known story, it ends with Hyde and Jekyll dead. Oops, <laughs> spoiler alert. That means there's no direction to take the story. People have definitely created alternative takes on the story, and those are some of my favorite, such as Valerie Martin's Mary Riley and David Levine's Hyde, but in the end, the story has trouble going beyond that. Meanwhile, the Hulk gives us all the flavor of Jekyll and Hyde, but has been an ongoing narrative for over 50 years. So it's no, it's no surprise, given the overlap, that we see Hyde becoming big and more hulkish. But this is where we come to the dilemma posed by the lecture's title. As we learned, vampires can make you famous. Dracula, as a public domain persona, has appeared in over 50 movies, most of which he was in the title. He also appeared in hundreds of TV shows, books, comics, video games, and yes, underwear as well. It's a shame I didn't do this video series before Valentine's Day. But the contrast I want to draw out here is that we are free to draw upon the commons, and we do so regularly. From the commons, we get some really amazing, moving, moving intriguing, and complex works. And of course, we get a lot of crap, too. But we get to take those ideas and play, adapt, and infuse them with new meaning. It's a create, great creative endeavor, and it's something many master creators inevitably do at some point in their career. However, while we are free to do this with stories of the long past, we cannot with the recent past. The Hulk is a great example. He is over 55 years old. His creator, Stan Lee, is 95 years old and still chugging along. This means that for pretty much most of us watching this, the Hulk will never be a public domain entity. 
Think about that. Even if, God forbid, that Stanley died today, the Hulk wouldn't be a public domain entity until 2088, about 125 years from its creation. So why does this matter? Because if copyright existed in the past as it does in the present, many of the works that I've mentioned would never have had the legacies that they have experienced. If you take a look at this list here, you have the authors, or you have the titles of the work, the authors, when they died, and when that work would have entered the public domain. Hell, even Stan Lee would have had to walk a fine line and risk lawsuit with the Hulk. But we wouldn't see Dracula until 1982, or Sherlock Holmes adaptations and experiments until 2000. We would have even been denied the classic War of the Worlds radio adaptation in 1938 by Orson Welles that we still talk about today. It's one of my personal favorites. This is the one where people supposedly were fleeing their houses thinking the Martians had actually landed. It was indeed the original fake news. So for me, this is where pop copyright becomes a de facto form of censorship. When it prohibits works from entering the public domain, and won't enter the domain until I'm decades dead. Even when those works, such as The Incredible Hulk, were largely created from the public domain from which it refuses to be a part of. And no, I'm not making this argument because I really want to tell my own stories using The Incredible Hulk, I promise. I just found The Incredible Hulk to be a perfect specimen to explain this phenomenon. But ultimately, if I were to try to tell a story today featuring the Hulk, Disney would likely sue me. So there you have your answer. But again, frustrated as I am with the de facto censorship of copyright works, what I have seen is an amazing splurge of creativity with works in the commons. Some of my favorite stories utilize the commons quite effectively. For instance, I'm a fan of The Walking Dead, more the comic series than the, the show. In there you have a zombie, a modernized monster of folklore. And I'm, also, uh, I'm absolutely... Uh, a fan of Fables, a comic book series that took so many characters from Pinocchio to the Oz characters to Snow White and the Big Bad Wolf and put them in modern day New York. And I absolutely loved Penny Dreadful for blending all those stories together. And I certainly enjoyed what the Frankenstein, Frankenstein Chronicles did um, and recently watched that on Netflix. In fact, I would say that one of the most creative and fascinating things to emerge out of this de facto censorship is the genre known as steampunk. For those unfamiliar with steampunk, it is a genre that blends elements of science fiction with the Victorian novel or the Western novel. Stories typically take place in the 19th century or the 20th century with the predominating technology being steam or pre-electric technology that can do many of the things we can do today. Many, but certainly not all often include feature often include or feature characters and figures from the era as well characters at least that are in the public domain it's a curious blend of past and future a setting and an atmosphere that can be used to tell other genres and retell previous stories if you remember a few years ago robert downey jr did two sherlock Holmes films in this fashion but there are others out there too like the wizard of oz dracula frankenstein and even william shakespeare each of them seeks to retell the classic stories with a little bit more hindsight, a little bit more use of steam technology, and a whole lot of what if, which is the start of so many a story. My argument would be that the reason steampunk exists is because of this desire to engage and use our past to explain our present, but with so much of our immediate past, nearly a hundred years, locked behind copyright, it's easier to draw upon and experiment with stories of old than new. Vampires are free, but the Hulk will cost you. So here we are at the intersection of copyright, censorship, creativities, and the commons. We've explored where, co where copyright comes from. We've looked at how valuable the commons are. We have examined how censorship can work directly and indirectly. And most importantly of all, we've seen how crea creativity is woven through all of this. If I have any parting conclusions, it would be this. If you wish to be a creator, think about how much previous works impact your creativity. None of us create entirely new things. We are constantly building upon that which we have been explored to and explored. And when creating, recognize that impact and limit locking away of your work for others to play with. 
Copyright is granted upon creation, but you as the creator can adjust your copyright as you see fit and maybe not have it locked away for 125 years. You could use Creative Commons in order to make your work available initially or after a certain point. For those of us that consume creative works, find and support creators who make their work more readily available, that is, for creators using the Creative Commons license. Those creators include people like Cory Doctoro, Charles Strauss, Brandon Sanderson, Kelly Link, Lawrence Lessig, Randall Monroe. If you played Cards Against Humanity, you're using something that recognizes and utilizes Creative Commons. So here are some examples of places that you can find content that's free to use, to, to enjoy or use because it uses Creative Commons licensing or is in the public domain. My favorite is the Internet Archive. Uh, I often go there to try to spend a few minutes and end up spending a few hours. And finally, let me just say, Jonathan Gostal calls humans the storytelling animal. We, more than any other species, create, tell, curate, and morph stories constantly through our lives, throughout our families, through our histories, throughout all the time that humans have spent on Earth. We love stories, and I think it's essential that we be mindful and smart about how much we lock away stories. Yes, it can yield some fascinating creative opportunities, but on the whole, I think humankind is served better when we can draw upon our collective tales and build our modern collection of new and twice or thrice told tales. Thank you all very much. So that's the full lecture. What did you think? How has this changed or influenced, or, or influenced your thoughts on copyrights, commons, censorship, or creativity? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, so please be sure to post them in the comments below, or hit me up on Twitter, at Leeton01, L-E-A-T-O-N-01, and see you soon. Keep popping, keep thinking.